All right, 301, that means it's time to go. Welcome everybody, thank you for joining today um, uh, for this Distilled Data Heartland Edition. Uh, my name is Tony Olson, I'm the Director of AI Strategy at Excellent Partners. Um, exciting to uh, be here with today with everybody and our, our partners, Alation Snowflake and Data IQ. Um, agenda for today, a couple housekeeping items at first. Um, we're gonna have a panelist a little bit later, so we wanna make sure we get uh, uh, some question and answers from the audience in. Um, second and off is some uh, in, is uh, presentations by Snowflake, Alation, and Data IQ, uh, followed by that customer panel featuring Emeritus and Builder Trend, which I'm really excited about, followed by that live Q&A. Um, and then we're gonna wrap up with a technical solution de demo. Actually, executing uh, a project, a real world project like you would see in a, with these three tools like you'd see in the real world. So um, that's, how it, that's how the order today will happen. So if you could submit your questions in the Q&A box in your Zoom navigation bar as we're going through the presentations and then even during the, the, the panel discussion, um, I'll be asking those questions uh, wrapping up the panel discussion. And I know that we always get a, Good, good, participa good, good participation on those, so I'll get them in early. Um, also, a link uh, to view the on-demand session will be emailed following the event. In case anybody's got a scoot and really wanted to catch the demonstration but uh, couldn't stick around for it. So Excelling Partners, a uh, little bit about us. Uh, again, Tony Olson, Director of AI Strategy here. Um, we help companies kickstart their data science or analytics practice. In some cases, we uh, accelerate their abilities through um, if it increased team efficiency and uh, also help manage data solutions if organizations don't want analytics uh, teams themselves. Um, a little bit about our story and why we were asked to speak here today. Uh, you know, we got, so we got started, our organization started in big data. Um, we were doing uh, global uh, machine failures, predicting machine failures and preventative maintenance. Um, and now we're in finance, logistics, manufacturing and healthcare. But along this five year journey, you know, we felt the pain of building scalable analytics as a professional services organization. Um, we are constantly bottlenecked by human and technical resource availability. You know, you can only have uh, so many siloed data science efforts before you run out of data scientists. Um, and then also compute and storage became an issue as we continued to scale for, at our clients. Um, we had the pain of losing data scientists. Uh, ours got picked up by Google, um, but I'm sure other people on this phone call have had their data scientists leave to um, some of the big firms out there. Um, and uh, there, there's, there's, a, there's a way to scale, and we had to search for that way, a way to scale uh, without getting tripped up by that. Um, the third point there is not maximizing value from intermediate data sets. A lot of the descriptive diagnostic analytics that we were doing on our way to more advanced analytics, we weren't maximizing the value of those data sets along the way um, for the business. So uh, we really had to, we struggled with that. And then finally, uh, this, is this is especially um, pertinent to a professional services organization, but also an enterprise. Um, you got to find a way to collaborate with the business. The business needs to understand how uh, how you're building these models. You need to be able to check uh, get, check to make sure that that the data is saying what you think it's saying along the way. So you know how could we do that? How can we feel? How can we recover from all those those pain points? So about two years ago, uh, we went on a searching expedition to relieve some of these pain points. The first thing we wanted to do is just improve execution and efficiencies of the analytics process um, by bringing other people in, um, by improving our ChrisDM lifecycle. Um, and uh, we landed on Data IQ. Back then, I think uh, they were a leader in the quadrant, uh, or a challenger in the quadrant, and we really became justified in our selection two years ago, this year, uh, as they became a leader. Um, Another thing that we want to do is improve scalability. That's not only from a personnel perspective, but also from a compute and storage perspective. So one of the big hurdles that we had was data preparation was taking a lot of time. Um, not only a lot of time, um, but data scientists, uh, they want to be spending their time on modeling. So uh, what are the way to make, how can we make that data preparation a little bit more consumable? Um, and that's where we found Snowflake and that really helped with a lot of that compute and storage challenge. Um, and then finally, leveraging and enable. So we have all these data sets that are out inside of our customers' enterprises. 
how do we find these intermediate data sets that we created along the way that have business value? How do we know that they're right? And how can we empower and enable people to make sure they're uh, to utilize that? And that's where Relation came into play in, in our journey. So um, with that, as, we, as, as you go through today's presentations, you're going to hear a lot of those same pain points resolved by these companies. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to hear uh, as we go into detail with each one. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kristen Warner from Snowflake. Take it away, Kristen. Thanks so much. Um, I will share my screen. All right, share and present. Cool. Can someone give me a quick check that uh, it's working on your end? You're good. Looks good. Thank you so much. OK, great. Um, <clears throat> So my name is Kristen Werner. I'm a director of data science and engineering at Snowflake. Um, I'm not going to run you through my whole background, except to say that I, I've been a customer of Snowflake on and off since 2016. Um, my first experience with Snowflake was with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and we chose to go with Snowflake for um, you know security reasons. Our back controls were really great, but we were also you know even though <clears throat> funding was pretty good, we were still a philanthropic effort. Um, and we found we were able to invest more in our data science and engineering over the data infrastructure and database administration um, by using Snowflake. And then again in 2018, I, um, I was doing another system migration um, onto Snowflake at a, a real estate company called Open Door, uh, where I was running the platform engineering team. Um, and, and now, uh, after, after being a long time customer, now I'm doing data science uh, on Snowflake. So it's become uh, yeah, very meta for me is uh, understanding Snowflake at Snowflake. Um, <clears throat> so kind of how we think about the data science um, field um, and uh, occupation is that like historically it's been, um, you know, we've kind of done look backs, right? You have reporting, you have, you know, BI that's gotten fancier as data has gotten bigger, but you're often doing look backs, like tracking things and trying to understand what happened and then like why it happened. But with an increased amount of information and historical data and compute um, power, we're able to start to think about how can we learn from the past and and have a reasonable guess at what's going to happen going forward. And so, you know, folks have moved into like forecasting, predictive analytics, and an extension of the idea of predictive analytics is is getting so good at our modeling to the point where we can make suggestions and set the strategy, like what should we do? What are the next steps and choices for the business? So truly driving, driving the business forward with data. Um, there you go. Oh. Um, and, 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 and this is really hard work. It's, hard, it's been hard work technically, and it's hard work within a, a business, but it's really worthwhile. So um, <clears throat> Harmony is one of our customers. They do uh, personal loans through, through a marketplace. Um, <clears throat> And, and what they found is just simply 1% improvement in their model is equal to a million dollars um, <clears throat> impact in the business per year. And so, so it's hard work, it's complicated work, but even those incremental changes can really be meaningful. Um, <clears throat> but, but as I said, part of that journey is just getting it there, getting it to the point where you can be moving your business forward. So the way we think about, um, and they super quote sort of, uh, we found just demonstrate that that sort of idea is that like there's a lot of work being done, but it's it, you know how do you get how do you get this last mile of data science um, to impact your business, and so how we think about this at Snowflake is how can we get you to that point faster. Um, so so what we've built is is a database. Um, th that's really what Snowflake is. And um, it's a place where you can bring all of your data together. So if you're dealing with a data lake or a data warehouse, or you're bringing in third party data, we have mechanisms to do all of this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a subsequent slide. Um, and then using the compute power and this auto scaling of your warehouse um, that we achieve through the separation of compute and storage, um, we can make your data preparation uh, more efficient. And, and this is for whoever you're preparing your data for. Um, you know, 80% of the work in machine learning, or you know, depending who you ask, 80% or more is data preparation. But that data prep is also common to your BI, uh, you know, business intelligence dashboards or your, you know, finance reporting or whatever. All of that work is the same, and we can bring it in one place and and scale it with with our architecture. Um, and we have an extensive partner ecosystem. Um, so we're really excited to talk with uh, Data IQ and Alation today about this, um, where we can. Once we get that data to your 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 
uh, machine learning tooling and data science tooling faster. That's really how we want to help accelerate um, the data science at your company. Um, and so the very basis, just to take a step back of, of you know, how the founding principles of, of Snowflake is that um, what we do is we, we mount virtual warehouses on top of any cloud provider. So GCP, AWS, Azure, wherever you're at. Um, and then we optimize the ability and auto scale your warehouse to the, the current needs when you need them by se separating the compute and storage across machines. Um, but you know, the company is seven years old now, um, a little more than five years general availability. And we started to take the next step of like, how can we think about supporting workloads that actually lead to business value? Like the data warehouse is great. Um, I think customers are seeing what, what I saw at Sean Zuckerberg initiative, which is if we take care of a lot of the warehouse tuning and everything for you, how can we um, help that next step and commodify that next step to business value? So we kind of think of these different workloads, like the storage piece, how are you storing data like data warehouse, the applications you can build on top of Snowflake, uh, data exchange, how can you pull in other data uh, seamlessly and with the schemas already managed for you? Um, but what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of the, the support we're, we're releasing right now for data engineering and your data science workloads. So we think of this in sort of six steps and for the data scientists and engineers on the call, you probably like know these steps pretty well and you know that they can be interchanged. They, they're very iterative um, and it takes a while to really, uh, for any given problem you're addressing to really solidify how this pipeline looks for that given set of data. Um, we, it's all built on top of the, the, the features that I uh, just talked about that are inherent to uh, Snowflake at its core. Um, and so how we think about the different steps is to collect the data. We support structured, semi-structured data. So you can bring in all the JSON you want. We'll auto partition it. Um, you can also use data sharing in our data marketplace. Um, so I, I do a lot of work in the go-to-market space. We, have, we do a lot of account enrichment. So we have a number of vendors that share data with us and um, through data shares. And so we get instant updates. So we can do, uh, we can, as soon as we learn about a new account, we can go shop it around through our data exchange and we can make sure that we have the most accurate information about that account. So our salespeople have the most information that they we can possibly provide them with when they go out into the field. Um, and we have a number of vendors on the data sharing, um, in the data sharing space. That just happens to be something that, that uh, I think a lot about on the day to day. Um, once you bring your, all your data into one place, then we give you tools to kind of explore um, the, the different data sets you have. So we have a, a tool called Snowsite. Um, we will be announcing more about that at our virtual summit in a few weeks. The June 2nd is the day um, where you can, it, it's, it's very lightweight visualization, like gives you an idea of uh, you know, what's the distribution of values across your columns and rows and, um, you know, allows you to do schema browsing, pin schemas, so you can make sure that whatever you've just brought in looks the size and shape and quality um, that, that you expect it to have. Similarly, for things that you maybe you have access to in the cloud but have not imported to the warehouse, but you just want to check them out, you can also query uh, cloud storage without actually loading that in to make sure you have what you want before you start working on feature engineering or transformation. We support um, SQL-based transformations through two tools stream, uh, called Streams and Tasks. Uh, they can work together. They work together really beautifully. They can also work independently. Um, so Streams is like change data capture. Did you did something? Did your data change in some way? Did it? Uh, did you delete, update, uh, insert, etc.? And Tasks are sort of a, a lightweight orchestration um, if you of, of table transformations. So from one SQL script to another, to you get to your target table. You can do all this development in, in your own uh, sandbox, so without duplicating data. So um, this is our zero copy cloning feature. And like I said, we try to make this as accessible as possible, making it all, um, you know, starting in this space with all SQL-based transform. And then that brings us to our partners. So um, when you, we, once you have your data prepared, you've done some amount of feature engineering, you have all of your operational stuff ready to go. Then you get to this point of, you know, we have a lot of direct, direct connect with a lot of partners. You can train, deploy, and then push that data back down um, to when you want to evaluate it or store it, um, you know, for, to compare future models versus past versus historicals. Uh, you can push that back down in Snowflake and, and store it there. Um, 
to, as I said, we have a, a, a huge, we want to meet our customers where they're at. So we have a huge network of partners, um, but we, we have some really special connections with Alation and Data IQ. Um, so we're really excited to talk with them today. Uh, Data IQ, they have a direct connect to Snowflake and a native write back to, to Snowflake across all platforms, um, which, is, which is really unique. Um, and also can perform all of the SQL that you need to have done, leveraging the compute power of Snowflake. So I think, I think that's, that's it for me. So I'm gonna pass it on to Connor now. Um. All right, great. Thanks, Kristen. Let me go ahead and share my screen now. Am I off? Okay, cool. Okay, quick check. Has everyone seen that okay? We gotcha. All right, excellent. So as Krista mentioned, uh, we've got a partnership uh, between Snowflake, Data IQ, and Alation. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Alation, uh, we pioneered the data catalog space back in 2015. Uh, and our ultimate goal is really not only to enable users to find, understand, and trust the data that might exist in your Snowflake data warehouse, but also really to drive value uh, from your current analytics investments. So when we start to think about our investments in Snowflake and becoming scalable and separating compute and resource and great data science platforms like Data IQ, Alation's sort of that glue in between to help your users understand where to find the data, but also reuse any sort of uh, analytics around the data itself. So really the problem that we aim to solve is this one right here, is that really finding and using the right data requires a lot of knowledge. So when we start to look at your data landscape, this is usually how users are navigating different systems. So you might have recently migrated to Snowflake uh, for obvious advantages, and you might still have some data maybe in your legacy systems. Uh, you might have you know, several BI tools across the board or CSV extracts. So historically, before Alation, this is kind of the process that people usually go through maybe when they need to build a new model or go through an analytics project from scratch. So a lot of times they're looking through uh, internal wikis, maybe it's in SharePoint or Confluence. They might be emailing or chatting somebody who they think might know the answer, or maybe they have just a, bit, a basic business glossary that defines, hey, here's what a customer is, but it doesn't actually help them get to that customer churn model uh, in the end game there. So what this typically does is really just produces an overwhelming volume of signals so a lot of decisions and analytics are really made based on intuition. So maybe what we think is right, but most of the time we find that users really end up in this place right here, falling back onto what we like to call tribal knowledge. So maybe I found the data set in Snowflake that I need to use and you know, push into data IQ. Uh, maybe I, you know, without elation, maybe I just found somebody who's the subject matter expert. And I might get my answer, but I probably just document that in a physical notebook, keep it to myself, and does, doesn't really scale for the rest of the organization. Now, when we start to look at the timeline to maybe leverage data and find it, let's say in Snowflake, uh, I have to go through that process, right? I ask around, I send emails. That can take anywhere from three to six weeks, especially if I'm unfamiliar if maybe the data has already been migrated through the pipeline, or maybe it's still in another system. Uh, from that point, then I need to understand the data. So I'm sure everybody's run their fair share of select stars just to get a sample of what that data might look like. And then I need to get to the point of trusting it. So I could get to the point where maybe there's several different copies of the same table across the board. Maybe I've spent three to six weeks trying to find the right data. And then I start to realize I'm maybe not even the right place. And then finally, we get to the point of actually leveraging the data. So maybe that's writing a query, uh, building a script. It might be uh, building a churn model within Data IQ. So this whole timeline historically has taken about anywhere from three weeks to two months on average. So what we want to do with Alation is really allow for self-service and compress that timeline from weeks and months down to just hours and days. So across our customers, what we've done is, first of all, increased analytical productivity uh, up by 50%. Because the users can go in, they can self-serve, understand what data exists, but also collaborate with others right within the same platform to get to their answers quickly. The other piece is Alation will point you to what data is most useful, what's being most used in the organization, meaning you can spend your time in terms of documentation and data stewardship in the right places, resulting in 40% documentation increase, 
And ultimately what we wanna do is really reduce that time to insight for analysis. So the solution we've built, and you'll get a preview of this when we get to the demo session towards the end here, is really no different from any sort of self-service catalogs that you're probably already using in your everyday consumer lives. And the major difference when we start to think about modern catalogs, and I'll take the example of Yelp, when I wanna go and find a restaurant, I have a collaborative approach with users, pictures, uh, recommendations on what to order, rather than just something like uh, Yellow Book where I just have a basic uh, restaurant title and hours, for example. So what we've done is we'll take projects uh, from Data IQ, we'll take data from Snowflake, we'll catalog those, we'll make them searchable, but then also start to connect the dots on what's most used, what are commonly used filters and joins, and what other projects are really related to this. And if we start to relate this to an everyday example, we start to uh, maybe look at Amazon. So if I'm going to, let's say, buy a new book, I can search in natural language, the top results come back for me, and then I have things like previews of the first chapter, uh, user reviews, I have a nice description of what the book means. I might be able to share this with somebody else who I think might be looking for something similar. And the data catalog from Alation is really no different. So if I'm going to search on a table, the top results will come back for me and I have all the information I need at my fingertips to know if this is an endorsed data set. I can see sample values, I can see business context around it, or maybe other relevant assets related to this. But another nice advantage is being able to collaborate. So being able to understand who are the top users of this and who is that right person to ask. So when we start to look at a customer specific use case, uh, and this is actually Pfizer, uh, who recently migrated to the cloud uh, a few years back, and they used Alation and Data IQ as their data science workbench. When they were looking for a solution to enable self-service, they were looking for three main things. And the first was uh, really discoverability of data. The second was consistency. So when we start to think about data science models and reports, we want to have be on the same page of what data we're using and what already exists. But the last piece was really the reusability. So that was not only around the documentation and what data existed, but also what work has been done on the data science and analytics side, which is where data IQ fit into place. So a use case that would actually leverage this for was across their uh, global groups, they were actually able to kind of centralize all the knowledge of not only what data existed, but also what work's been done around the data to really enable new diagnosis and trials for rare diseases across the board. So as we start to look at the benefits of uh, Snowflake and Alation and uh, Data IQ together, uh, you'll start to see how these pieces all really fit together uh, when we get to the demo here. So that's it for the Alation overview and JB, I'll kick it off to you. All right, thanks, Connor. Um, okay, is everybody able to see my screen? Yep, we got gotcha. you. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Again, uh, my name is JB Neal. I'm a senior account executive with Data IQ. I've been with Data IQ for about two years now, and I really appreciate everybody joining. It's nice to um, actually inter interact with a huge group of people after being in quarantine for so long, but um, really excited about the Q&A coming up and the, the demo. Um, I'm going to give you a, a really brief high level overview of Data IQ. And um, really, I just want to start off by sharing a slide that uh, one of our clients actually shares with the new groups that are being onboarded onto Data IQ. So um, this is from a top 25 global bank. And uh, the purpose of this is just to say to the, the new teams coming in, hey, um, these are the challenges we had. This is why we bought Data IQ to solve these challenges. And this is essentially why you're here. Um, and that's that we had multiple labs to manage and govern. Um, we needed to enable deployment of our advanced analytics and, and ML projects. Um, our data science team is not completely made up of data scientists or coders, but we have a lot of different skill sets. So we needed to you know, bring in an end-to-end -end platform that was made for both coders and clickers to work together. Um, we need to get to a push button deployment and, and be flexible enough to do that on-prem or in cloud. And then really most importantly is centralizing the, the data science community so that we can do things like, like reuse the, the data and the models and the processes that all the different groups are using. 
um, simplify the, the experimentation and uh, the data wrangling that's being done, and then really, uh, most importantly, break down the silos between all the teams here. So um, hopefully some of these challenges um, are, are sound familiar to you, and um, you know, if we get a chance to talk more, these are the type of things that you know, we really focus on with clients and helping you solve. So, uh, but, but first, you know, what is Data IQ? So we have one offering, and that's called Data Science Studio. And, and when we say an end-to-end -end platform, uh, really that means uh, four key pillars within Data IQ. So, so number one is data access. So all of the users that are working together on a project in Data IQ um, are able to access data no matter where it's stored in your organization from multiple sources uh, via self-service or click of a button. Um, and then bring all that data together to do uh, number two, uh, data cleansing. So uh, once you have the data you want, you can uh, visualize, visualize uh, cleanse, prep, and transform that data uh, to get it ready for analysis. Um, and then number three, machine learning. So in Data IQ, you can take two paths with machine learning. You can go uh, the auto ML path where you can either let Data IQ completely build the model for you and go back and see what we did and, and make some changes or let Data IQ guide you through the machine learning process. Um, you're also able to work completely in whatever open source code language you want to work in uh, while building out your machine learning models in Data IQ. Um, and then once you have a data product or a model that's you know, ready to put in production, uh, number four, you're able to deploy into production uh, and then continue to score and monitor and really automate the entire workflow you've built in Data IQ. Um, and then while working in Data IQ, um, you're able to work in um, either a visual or, or point and click fashion or completely in whatever open source code language uh, you as a coder or a data scientist uh, like to work in. So that's technically what Data IQ does. Um, a little more strategically and, and really why we exist um, and Kristen hit on this whenever she had the ML flow on her slide but uh, what the way we look at that is that that whole analytic life cycle um, every company we talk to is trying to get from the initial design and prototyping stages to production operationalizing their projects and and truly enterprise AI and um, you're, everyone's trying to do this with less, less complexity and more time to value and virtually every company we talk to tells us we have good tools and point solutions and software to do all these different features and techniques in this life cycle. Our challenge is, is that our data, our people, and our processes are very siloed by nature. And so that's really why Data IQ exists and, and what we do. We, we take the, that silo uh, and those walls down between all the different people working on projects in, um, in your organization. And, and really that becomes twofold where you have one centralized platform, Data IQ, where you can do all the different features and, and techniques and capabilities that you need to access data, prep and cleanse data, build models, deploy them in production, monitor those models. That's all happening in one place. But really most importantly, we make Data IQ so that all of the critical people in your organization that need to contribute to your analytics projects can work in a way that best suits their skill sets. So data analysts, business analysts, data engineers, data scientists, IT leadership, everyone's able to work in one place, communicate and collaborate. And that's really where we see the biggest gains in that analytic life cycle. And, and we end up having clients come back to us and tell us things like, our model validation group used to take eight weeks to um, go through the modeling process and get a model in production. Now it takes less than two. Um, our risk model used to take almost three months to build from scratch and put in production. And even then the data was out, outdated. Uh, now we can build that all in scratch in one day and we have the absolute most up-to-date data. Um, we had a global team working on a part standardization process where we had teams in India, the US, and Europe. And uh, that was a nine month project for us. In Data IQ, in a POC by the way, uh, we were able to do that in two weeks and with one part found a $20 million delta. So, so these are the really big impactful projects that we at Data IQ tackle. And really, uh, we do that by focusing on that entire analytic life cycle and bringing all of those key people into the fold to help with these projects. So now a little bit about how Data IQ fits into your ecosystem. So we are built as a very lightweight orchestration platform. And what I mean by that is um, we don't care what kind of uh, programming or coding language you want to use. We didn't build our own. We let you as data scientists and coders uh, come to the table with R, Python, SQL, whatever big data flavors, whatever versions of those languages you want to use. You can use that all in Data IQ on projects. Um, we don't care where your data lives today or where it lives tomorrow. So most companies we talk to are undergoing some sort of transformation where they're sunsetting legacy databases or EDWs or moving to cloud. 
most more oftentimes than not, Snowflake is involved in that. So that's why we have such a, a heavy uh, partnership with Snowflake. But um, your analytics and data science teams don't have to worry about that data moving around. Data IQ will always point to where that data uh, lives. So we're a nice bridge between current and future state. Uh, we fit right into your ecosystem in terms of your uh, data cataloging and enterprise BI platforms. And then um, we're always uh, maximizing the most up-to-date technologies and uh, features around DevOps and machine learning libraries if, if your company's wanting to take advantage of Kubernetes or TensorFlow, wherever that be. So DataQ is always just kind of that orchestration layer sitting on top of your whole tech stack at, within your organization. Um, and then just a little bit about Data IQ background wise. Um, we're about an eight year old company. We were actually founded in Paris, France, but we moved our headquarters to New York City in 2017. Um, up to this point, um, through our third round of funding, we've raised about 150 million, um, had a, a recent cool investment from uh, Google's investment arm, Capital G. Um, and we have around 300 customers worldwide. Um, and uh, we are certainly not a uh, industry specific company. So we found that, that the complexity in that analytic life cycle and kind of the siloed natures of, of organizations is very consistent in all industries. And, and that's why we have so many clients uh, that are some of the biggest and most innovative in, in all of the uh, industries worldwide. And as Tony uh, pointed out at the beginning, we're very proud to announce that we were um, listed as a leader in the uh, AI and ML uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant 2020. And then, um, you know, before I pass it off for the, the Q&A, I uh, just wanted to share an example of um, one of our largest clients. So um, GE came to us and said, hey, you know, we're trying to become more of a business-led analytics organization and um, really empower our business to do more with data innovation. And our challenge is we can do that in pockets, but how do we scale that out to the entire organization? So they created the self-service data team. And um, I would encourage you, you'll have access to these white papers, but this team created uh, a great white paper that documents how GE Aviation specifically transformed from a siloed organization to completely self-service where the business is really driving innovation there. And, and we co-authored this with them and Data IQ and um, Alation are really the foundation for this. And today they have thousands of users and data products in production. Um, uh, approaching a thousand automated projects and these use cases are being used across um, virtually every uh, group within um, GE Aviation. So, um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense of data IQ and where we fit in. And um, with that, uh, Tony, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, JB. All right. Um, with that, I would like to introduce to the table uh, Lorenzo Ball Jr., Vice President of Data and Analytics at Emeritus, Preston Badir, Data Strategist at Builder Trend, and then Kristen Warner, uh, Data Scientist at Snowflake, who we've heard from um, uh, so for, the, for this panel discussion. Um, you know, I thought it'd be good to kick this panel discussion off with just, I, I guess, some introductions, uh, not only about yourself, but also a little bit about your journey at your organization from an analytics perspective. Um, you know, specific to maturity level and, uh, and maybe a little bit of, of, of future state too. So Lorenzo, I thought maybe you want to quick, uh, quick introduce yourself and after that we'll, we'll switch over to Preston. Sure, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. All right, perfect. Yeah, so I uh, started at a modus about two years ago. Uh, was brought in to really spearhead uh, data and analytics uh, program and really help the organization to become insight driven. And to give everyone a background about Emeritus, we are a mid-sized uh, um, insurance uh, company that uh, supports life annuities, uh, you know, policies, group health uh, benefits, uh, retirement plans, uh, and some, uh, you know, wealth management. And so we have a, a pretty diverse portfolio and, um, you know, part of being in the insurance industry, you know, we do have a, a lot of actuarial science uh, that is really opening up to, to using, you know, data science type techniques to, to help with some of the models for pricing, renewals, mortality, and things like that, as well as just the, the change in, um, in the industry and, and how, uh, insurance is trying to, to interact with, with customers a little bit different than, you know, your traditional, uh, you know, go get your, your life policy. And so, you know, with that strategy in mind, uh, you know, part of 
you know, our journey is to, uh, you know, build um, data science capabilities, uh, machine learning type capabilities to, to really fuel uh, a, a few key, key areas for us, um, especially in, in actual science uh, underwriting uh, and, and some, you know, financial, you know, activities that, that we do. Uh, as well as on the data side to, to be able to ena enable that. And so uh, you know, I've been there, like I said, two years, and uh, we, we've uh, been, been on that journey and uh, look to, to kind of share some insights into that. Awesome. Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, how about you, Preston? Yeah, so uh, I'm a data strategist at Builder Trend, which is kind of like product strategy at the data science layer. Um, I actually started out at Builder Trend uh, about a year and a half ago on the product strategy team. And uh, we've just grown our data science function like crazy. We have a, it's kind of become a top level uh, business function and I moved along with it. Um, and it's been a really awesome journey. Uh, what we do at Builder Trend is we make project management software for construction companies. Uh, so for the audience here, if you've ever used something like Asana or Jira or various, you know, task management tools, just think that, but very specific to the construction industry and then multiply it by like 10, right? You probably use a bunch of different tools like Google Cloud and Gmail um, alongside your task management tools. We kind of do all of that stuff together uh, in one place for the construction industry. And as far as our kind of um, data science maturity, it's super new for us, honestly. We've, uh, we just kind of started doing data science about a year before I joined Builder Trend, um, but it's just been moving incredibly fast. We've grown from two people to um, close to 12 now, I believe. Uh, and now we're kind of just focused on going from setting the ground level insights for every different department and just giving everyone the data and uh, exposing things that they need to know to just getting everything to level two and really modeling and um, scoring and kind of all of the next generation uh, insights that a lot of companies are probably already doing um, that we're kind of launching for the first time and just seeing huge impacts for across the business. It's, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome, great. Um, uh, so Kristen, I know that you already introduced yourself. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering if you can discuss a little bit about your past experiences and your experiences with Snowflake now, um, specific to centralization of data assets um, and how, and maybe how key or, you know, maybe some of the hurdles along with that that you've experienced um, uh, specific, uh, specific to your past. Yeah, um, yeah, so I, I've seen like many iterations of data teams and I, I've, I've grown a few myself at this point. Um, I think there, there are a few things that I, I've learned. Um, one is that you, know, you want to have as you, you want to define metrics in one place. Um, and this is something that I really like at Snowflake, we have uh, the opportunity to champion that um, is that you, know, you don't have many people uh, calculating revenue. Um, Right, like how we calculate revenue may change uh, based on pricing, billing, whatever, or um, how, how do we think about daily active users? I want the person that works on, you know, daily active users the most, I want them to define that and I don't want to redefine it. And every time they change it, I want to inherit that um, into my tables. So I think creating that, that discipline around, um, you know, a, like a single source of truth for, for metrics um, is really important. And then that, naturally dictates centralized uh, data resources. Um, how you, but you're, that doesn't mean your team necessarily has to be centralized. Um, in some organizations, um, you know, that doesn't work well at, at the beginning, right? Um, sometimes that, when that happens, um, if you centralize too much, you, you end up trying to cover way more breadth in the business than you're capable of doing a good job at. Um, something that like my our team has been um, you know ha has been very lean and what I continuously communicate to them as well as our business stakeholders is that I am interested in completing projects well and not doing half projects all over the place. Um, 
because if we do half of a project or we do we don't we do some work but only do it you know half heartedly um, we're not providing that that to me is no value to the business um, what I want to do is complete things you know in a focused way and generate the demand to have more to hire more data scientists who can be equally as focused um, but as a, as an organization grows I think it's really nice to have to to start to at least create um, you know a data culture that even if you are federated across organizations that you're able to align on career expectations um, you know quality standards of code um, and, and how, how you're how you're going to organize your warehouse uh, holistically does that kind of get at your question that's exactly it yeah I appreciate that um, you know you brought up two things uh, just metrics and then also you know if I could take that to the next step is is priorities and um, you know when I, at least though I've I've seen this with my clients is that there's usually never a shortage of use cases. Um, so Lorenzo, uh, you know, going off of what Kristen said with metrics, and then maybe adding in priorities. How do you navigate that um, yeah, that backlog uh, of of all the work that that likely needs to get done, and how do you prioritize that um, inside of your organization? Yeah, I think that's a an age old question in, in this space, right? <laughs> um, I don't think there's there's a shortage of demand, but um, you know, from a, a an analytic perspective, um, you know, we are at Emeritus just starting off on that journey to an extent. Um, you know, we do have a, a handful of, of data scientists, uh, you know, in our organization, um, and we are looking to. Um, you know, uh, build it, well, one, we're building it in my organization and then looking to, to grow it. And, and so just to, to go back to, to what Kristen said really quickly, um, you know, I, I'm a believer as well that I think, um, you know, as at least for, for, for my space, you know, bringing a, being an enterprise organization, I do look to have and grow data science capabilities within the functions of the business. And, you know, my team be able to support uh, you know, those data scientists and, and their needs. Uh, so may that be around, um, you know, model management methodology around, you know, certain um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, models that are developed, uh, the efficacy of, you know, those models, as well as, uh, you know, auditing and, and performance. But, you know, I, I do think that, you know, being closer to, um, you know, the function definitely provides a lot more value than, than I can see, you know, in, in my organization. And so we try to, to at least um, you know build that, that type of culture um, because it also helps the business learn how to use uh, analytics in, in in a better way. And so as we go back to your question around priority, um, you know I think that uh, you know as I work with those partners and grow that skill, um, I'm able to at, at the very least work on the the priorities that they request in in a federated fashion. And so typically my organization. Uh, or should get, you know, some of the, maybe the harder challenges that may need, um, you know, the engineering, more engineering or more ops, you know, to be able to help support to develop and, and deploy um, and, uh, you know, leaving any other sort of uh, research or analysis, you know, within the business. Uh, but typically, um, you know, how we rate and, and move things up and down, you know, the backlog, it is on value. So, you know, as an example, you know, we use um, a methodology um, to, to, determine, to determine the value, and that uh, is, in summary, you know, just the, the amount of time it, it may take to build a model, the type of data uh, that's required if we have it or not, um, you know, the, the skill set, uh, you know, that's required, and then ultimately the return to, to the business. So, as an example, you know, one of the things we were looking hard at is claims, you know, claims for um, you know, any any part of our business is is a, is a huge expense, and especially given you know this time, uh, you know, given um, you know the, the pandemic, it's like how how do we be able to understand what our potential claims you know may be, and um, you know how do we you know, use certain techniques and models to be able to forecast and, and plan for you know that outlay that may you know increase, and so if we can show um, you know what's being done now today compared to what a, a model can prove and, and return for us, there's some significant savings that, that's possible there. And so uh, once you put uh, you know, a dollar amount, it also helps uh, it to be um, easier to, to, to justify it you know, being prioritized and worked on immediately. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. You know, that dollar amount really, <laughs> that really usually turns some heads, right? Um, uh, actually, just something out to the audience right now, make sure you get your Q&A or your questions into the, um, to the Zoom. Uh, we'll be shifting over to, over to audience Q&A here in a couple minutes. Um, Preston, you mentioned that you've grown from two to 12, uh, uh, that team. Um, can you describe some of those scalability challenges you had and maybe, a, maybe your biggest lesson learned as you, uh, as you grew? Yeah, um, I mean, first and foremost, hiring is really hard, right? And uh, we, we have the privilege of working at one of the best places to work probably in the world. Uh, we just got a Inc. reward for being one of the best places to work and we won uh, two years in a row best place to work uh, for our city in Omaha. And so we feel like we have the privilege of being able to be a bit more selective about who we hire and we intentionally really take our time um, but you kind of have to be ready to suffer the consequences of slow hiring if that's the strategy you're going to take. So we have a lot of folks who are able to wear multiple hats and are comfortable doing that. And a lot of that happens, uh, you know, as we wait to find the right person. So for us, honestly, there was a big kind of gap between when we decided, hey, we really need to grow this team and when that growth kind of took place. And it really was sudden, um, just kind of by coincidence, uh, we found the right people for a couple of different roles right around the same time. Um, so it was pretty wild. We, we were kind of stretched pretty thin for a while. And then we had the issue of uh, suddenly scaling and needing to onboard a bunch of folks at once. Um, so I would say our problems were a little bit unique in that sense. We didn't, it wasn't a very linear way to scale, um, but really, you know, common issues, um, stuff around documentation and uh, how do you properly onboard someone when you don't have uh, great documentation around where data lives and how it gets there and what calculations you use for what. Um, so more than anything, I think it was uh, a lesson in making sure that our team was just communicating really, really well and taking a lot of good notes on gaps that we have and need to solve uh, before we scale more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, those are all <laughs> those are all challenges I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, uh, Kristen, so uh, a lot of data science is utilizing external data sources um, to enrich and enhance um, uh, uh, experiments. So I, I'm I'm curious, you know, with you moving to Snowflake and your recent um, uh, external data sources and data sharing capabilities. Has that changed your, the way that you approach problems in any way um, or, uh, or the way you've seen your customers uh, approach uh, some of their data science initiatives? Um, yeah, so certainly. So I, I, I alluded to one of my like personal everyday problems and thinking about how do we support the field in terms of um, you know, doing uh, data quality and data enrichment work. I think though um, something that is probably more um, in the social conscience right now is the COVID-19 data sets. Um, so uh, the state of California, like many healthcare companies have been leveraging the same, we've consolidated a lot of, um, a lot of information around COVID-19 um, in, in one of, in our data exchange so that folks can just access everything in there. Everyone's accessing the same information. Um, you don't, you know, you don't have to, pay multiple people or try to figure out how to get access to it. Um, if you want to do reporting or, you know, submit your data into there and share it with other people instantly. Um, I think that that's been very powerful, um, you know, in this kind of uncertain time. Um, but, it, but it has very practical ongoing um, applications. So um, a little bit more about what, what we do um, in terms of account enrichment is that, you know, you get a lot of information in Salesforce and, um, you know, many of most of our customers use Salesforce as well and and um, to for folks in the field to monitor their their emotions and they'll you know they'll input or bring in an account ID from somewhere um, and data sharing because it's instant access um, that we can always update those accounts we can do account hierarchies we can do cleanup 
So, you know, people, there's all sorts of duplicates, junk accounts, uh, self-service accounts. How do we know the self-service accounts belong to, you know, a, an existing customer or an existing opportunity or something like that? It's all through this matching algorithm that we run and it's able to run faster and more up to date because we have this data sharing and then we can send it right back out to, to Salesforce. So it's in the hands of people who can use it. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually one of our favorite features when we're running a, um, a prediction, you know, off of, typically in data IQ, it's kicking out a, an enriched data set with a prediction in it. And then in Snowflake, being able to share that back immediately with the customers. Um, pretty fantastic. Yeah, and I hope it, I'm really excited about the feature. Honestly, I think it's I think it's one of the most exciting things that's going to have, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the idea that I talked about in the first question with the single source of truth is that, you know, what happens if we're all we're, we're all on the same page, you know, if we're talking about account enrichment data, we're talking about, you know, uh, healthcare data, we're talking about whatever, um, you know, what if we're all talking about the same thing. And I, I, I think I'm really excited about the maturation of that product. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lorenzo, I guess elaborating a little bit on the metrics and priorities question that we had earlier, um, you know, taking some from what, what Preston discussed, you know, being in um, working with actuaries, you typically they typically have a um, uh, a pretty good handle on a lot of the a lot of the different science and probably um, uh, a lot of interest in advancing analytics in your in your organization. But what what roadblocks have have you seen in implementing uh, data science and advanced analytics, and how have you mitigated them at, at Meritess? Good question. Um... I don't know if I quite mitigated them quite yet, <laughs> quite honestly. <laughs> um, but they, um, you know, I think I think it, it's, it's twofold. Um, you know, one, uh, you know, University of Nebraska um, has one, if not if, the top uh, actuary science program in the nation, right? So I mean, it's definitely top five, and um, you know, they do uh, a really good job of of training, uh, you know, their students and, and having them, you know, perform pretty well. And so, uh, you know, we get, uh, a, I would say like a cohort every year, you know, into Emeritus and, um, and, and one challenge that the, the chief actuary and I discuss is, uh, you know, we're, we're, they're coming out of, of school knowing R and Python and, um, you know, our traditional uh, uh, technology uh, uh, stack as well as uh, our, our models aren't necessarily built on that. And so, you know, they are seeing a, a, a trend and, and a change of how you use data and build, you know, models for, um, you know, for a number of things. And so, you know, I do think they are, are a lot more open than, you know, years past and, and being able to use some of the, the techniques and algorithms that, uh, you can 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 do within data science than your your traditional actuary you know activities. So that's one. Um, you know, two. I think um, you know part part of what they were were doing before was uh, you know long term progression uh, projections uh, and and using you know really specific techniques to to kind of determine uh, you know just say mortality as an example or morbidity. And, um, you know, I think now that you have the ability to scale out data, um, you know, for um, really, you know, uh, a unlimited size, right, um, you can do a lot more techniques to information. And, you know, I think, you know, we, we all want data to be pristine, right, especially from an actuarial perspective. Uh, but if you can begin, you know, using estimation techniques for, for some of your models and have the compute to, to run, you know, various uh, Know, variations of those estimates, the, the conversation changes for them. And, and so, you know, part of the journey that, you know, we built was trying to build out, you know, more of a modern data architecture where, you know, you are getting that additional compute and you have, uh, you know, kind of elastic compute and, and unlimited storage to, to be able to, to, to do things that they uh Oh, we lost Preston. I'm sorry, we lost Lorenzo. Oops, no worries. Um, Lorenzo, if you hop back on, please do let me know. Can you, um, but, oh, can you there we me? go. Yeah, we got you. Yep. <laughs> All right, not, not too sure what happened there, but um, in short, um, you know, I think given, 
the new um, modern data technology and techniques that you know allow them to use data differently um, has opened the door in the conversation for um, the actuaries to, to use platforms like uh, uh, you know the data lakes and snowflake and you know data IQ to, to build some of their models yeah thank you for that um, so we're going to enter into the Q&A section of the panel discussion today, or right now. Um, and actually, Preston, you're up, um, called out by name. Um, I'll read this out loud, and then uh, if you need me to repeat anything, please do. Preston mentioned launching data science solutions that accelerated the adoption of additional data science solutions. What challenges does he or the panel see with managing the company mindset that is hungry for data science, but may not fully grasp the principles? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I'm interpreting that as kind of like data literacy when people want to use data science to make more money, uh, but don't really necessarily understand the results that you're presenting or, or maybe even the data you're presenting for interpretation. Um, that's a great question. I think especially early on, you have to spend as much time, probably a lot more time, honestly, uh, distilling your insights and learnings than you actually spend gathering them. And I think that can be really tough for people who are uh, in the weeds. I think the more kind of in the weeds a, a person is, the harder it makes uh, presenting high level stuff and not the details. So I really think you've got to work as a team, um, bring in kind of maybe people's uh, bosses or managers to review those presentations and just whittle it down and keep it really, really, really simple. And um, in my experience, the, the best way to do that is to let people create their really detailed slides and keep them, you know, keep them in a, a sort of index for Q&A. And if somebody ends up asking a question and wanting more detail, uh, it, you know, you look good by flipping to a prepared slide that wasn't a part of the core presentation um, where you go into much more detail, but I, I think it's really difficult to explain something like, you know, how does a random forest model work um, to a layman in a, in a way that makes sense and helps them read a dashboard on like feature importances more easily. So I really think you just have to spend a lot of time distilling those insights down and making your presentations uh, really, really easy to interpret. Yeah, um, if I could add on there, some, uh, a technique that we use in that uh, along those same lines as uh, uh, multiple week uh, meetings a week for the business where the where we're just inside of data IQ and it might not be the end result but we're sharing the, uh, the the cleaning and the preparation that's going on and you know just quick throwaway dashboards that we then interrogate with the business so that's a, a that's been a technique that we found also to be um, uh, very effective um, next question, Kristen, you mentioned taking a project through to the end, so there's quality uh, and packaged result. How do you recommend communicating the value of this to business partners instead of being rushed onto the, you know, the quote unquote next project? Um, so I think, yeah, yeah, uh, right. There's no shortage of data work. Um, so I, I think this is sort of dovetailed into the last questions in some sense is like, um, I, I encourage everyone on the team and I work really hard to make sure we do projects that are going to have clear business impact. Um, to know what that is and to be in agreement on it and be able to scope projects, we sit very, very closely with our business partners um, so that we can be in tune with you know, what decisions are they trying to make and how quickly do they need to make them and then we scope our work accordingly. But, um, you know, the, the work is, I tell my team all the time, like your work does not exist if you do not effectively communicate it. Um, if they don't hear you and they don't take an action on it, um, like we haven't done anything and, and we haven't delivered on the, the, you know, value of or the proposed value of having a data scientist on your team. So, um, so we communicate whether whether people ask for it or not. Um, and then if somebody, I, I provide that air cover, if somebody is asking like, where's this, where's that, where's the other thing? And you know, I'm saying like, we're, we're doing something else right now. 
And if you want me to drop that thing, like then I ask them to like on the spot prioritize. Um, you know, we are estimating to have this done in two days. If you want me to drop that, uh, that the previous result you asked for will not be will be delayed by X amount of time. If you're okay with that, I'm happy to pick up this other piece of work. Um, so I think being really clear, communicating often, um, scoping your projects well, uh, helps you get the air cover you need to to do things to completion and helps you work uh, very tightly with the business to make sure you are working on the highest priority thing. Thank you. Um, I know that it's 401. We're supposed to switch over to the uh, um, the, the demonstration. I thought we just, uh, Lorenzo, do you want to take this last question here? Um, and then we'll, then we'll flip over. Um, so there's, there's two questions left. One is how does a data engineer work best with a data scientist, which I think in the demonstration we might be able to cover. Um, but uh, Lorenzo, if you could answer this one, this would be great. Um, so this is a comment off of Preston's uh, previous comments. So politics and lack of fundamental understanding can, be, can cause some pushback for C-suite backers of data science. If AI is beyond the horizon of them and they're still grasping for BI, what's a big aha moment to get them to move? And what advice do you have for those where you were, uh, uh, where you, where, who are where you were 18 months ago? Sure, um, I, I can you know, maybe comment to that really quick. Um, you know, I think the, the first uh, thing, and I think Preston uh, alluded to it, I think is the data literacy is just, is just critical, right? Now, and I use that as a, as a broad term, but it's, it's data and analytic uh, literacy of just one, you know, what does it mean to have, um, you know, AI uh, analytics, you know, within the organization? And what, what does it mean to, to use, you know, data in, in an organization in, in the right way? And that's all the way down to, um, you know, the value comment and, and understanding to the type of data required for certain type of models, right? I mean, you need to have, uh, you know, your leaders be immersed in that experience and, and understand it. Obviously, they won't know the detail of it, but um, they need to understand just the process. I think, too, is uh, just identifying the, the, the right partners, right, um, that can uh, help you along that journey. So while all uh, C-suite, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, leaders uh, understand, you know, what can be done here, you know, you have at least one that really understand or have interest in it, and, and maybe that's your partner, right? Uh, it, it may not be the highest value area that, um, you know, you, you can focus on, uh, but uh, if you have a partner that you can get something completed, get the, uh, and, and show the results of it, that goes a long way to, um, you know, being able to, to kind of showcase it and bring everyone else along. And then the last one I would say is, is just document experiences. I think as you can showcase um, and show value and, and, and communicate and market that value, um, you know, the, the ship would steer so that people, uh, the right way, the way you want it to go, uh, so that your, your leadership from the C-suite down can understand what analytics can do to an organization. Awesome. Thank you, Lorenzo, for that. Um, Lorenzo, Preston, Kristen, thank you so much. Uh, this wraps the panel Q&A session of today. Um, thanks for your time. Um, and we're going to move on to the, um, uh, the demonstration uh, where I'm going to hand it over to uh, one, of the, one of the people on my team, Ryan Moore, who I'll let him introduce himself. Ryan, I know uh, we'll probably go to 435 here. I think we the, the tightest we've done this is at about 30 minutes. So um, <laughs> uh, we'll go for, we'll, uh, we'll try to squeeze it in. And then if anybody has any questions that as we go through, please do type that in the Q&A. And if we do have three, four, five minutes that we could stick around at the end, we will try to answer those. So with that, uh, Ryan, do you want to take the realm? Sounds good. Thanks, Tony. My screen showing okay? We got you. Terrific. All right, as Tony mentioned, my name is Ryan Moore. Um, I'm the director of AI solutions at Excellion Partners. Um, and Tony told the story a little bit about um, how we went through some data science challenges as we moved from being an IoT organization, collecting um, tremendous amounts of big data and really establishing um, a data science practice um, and I got the opportunity during that transition to evaluate a lot of the products on the market and really kind of greenfield 
um, put together a best of breed architecture and, and look at what are the best of breed um, products that are available and how can they work together. Um, so I've had a lot of opportunity to work hands on with many products on the market, but in particular, um, Data IQ, Snowflake, Annihilation, which is really where we landed um, because we felt it, it really was the best combination to facilitate um, data science efforts. So um, I'm going to walk through a project today um, where we are going to be playing the role um, of a data scientist at a telecom company that provides cell phone plans um, to customers. Um, and one of the kind of as background, um, we've heard as a data scientist through that, that tribal knowledge um, that, that Connor mentioned earlier that there's historical and there's current um, operations data from our customers. Uh, those are like phone plans and, and usage information, um, as well as another data source that has customer service data um, that we've obtained from our customer service team that has um, information about you know, problems people are having that they're calling in about, as well as when those customers maybe have left um, our organization from a historical standpoint. So the goal we've heard from our, our business is that we want to be able to predict customers that are going to uh, leave our service before, uh, before they do. So we're going to look at our current customers and try to predict which ones are at risk of leaving because maybe they are, they're showing patterns or usage patterns that would indicate that they're at high risk of leaving our service. Um, I should say as well, uh, to reiterate what Tony said, I'll be moving really quickly to, to get through in, in about 30 minutes, but if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to toss them in the Q&A and um, we can stick around at the end and, and answer anything um, that I don't get to. Um, the first step that we'll, we'll take in this project is to import a data set. Uh, we mentioned that um, two data sets that we have available, one is operational data and one is customer service data. And something that we will talk a lot about is um, breaking down of silos. I know JB um, talked about the breaking down of different silos and really one of the first um, pieces of siloing in data science is that siloing of knowledge of information, right? So we know we have data somewhere, we might have information about our operations, but where is it? And that's something that Alation can, can help us with in being that catalog. So with a, you know, an easy search, uh, uh, English search, I can type in um, churn operations to do a search of the, the data that we have cataloged and the sources that we've cataloged in our organization and see that we have a table that does supply that customer service plan and usage data that we are looking for. And we can see that it's even been endorsed by a user. So we do get some validation. Um, and like, like Connor had mentioned from the Alation team that if we do not have the ability to get these types of endorsements and this ease of access, we might end up looking for a week to find a specific data source and once we start using it, we might go another week um, before we find out that it's actually outdated and no longer the best source of data. So um, this ability from Alation to point us in the right direction quickly um, is exceptionally important, um, as well as to collaborate with other users, maybe ask questions about this source of data so we can you know, get down the right path quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and select that data source. Um, so this, this shows the integration between data IQ and Alation. So with Alation, we were able to navigate to that source. And now with data IQ, we are going to point to the table that exists within Snowflake. So I'm importing a reference to that Snowflake table in my data IQ project. So I'm not actually copying any data. All I'm doing is just uh, making a reference to that location. And we can see that Data IQ is allowing us to preview our data before we officially link to it and create a data set. 
And we now have a, a visual, a preview of a sample of the data that's in that operations data set. Um, and again, down the path of breaking down data silos, um, with access to this type of visualization tool that allows us to, um, to access the data, not only um, us as a member of the data science team, as a data scientist, but also um, data analysts and what we like to call the citizen data scientists are able to access the same data set as part of the same project. And with a couple of clicks, um, do visual analysis of the data um, to understand you know, the distribution, um, you know, what in this case, like the daytime minutes, what is the average daytime minutes that our customers are using on their cell plans? Um, what does that distribution look like? And easy to um, take this information, communicate it back to the business and get feedback almost immediately um, to make sure that we, again, have the right data source and it is in a state that will be beneficial for us in this project. Um, so I've linked to one um, Snowflake data table, and I think that this is a, a good point as well as far as the breaking down of, of um, the, these silos. This operations data might originate um, from one source, um, and the next data source that we're going to look for, which is the customer service data, might be coming from a completely different origin. Um, with Snowflake maybe acting as our data warehouse or our data lake, that is bringing those two different disparate sources together and putting them in one place um, for accessibility in our data science project. So I'm again going to uh, navigate to the Alation plugin in Data IQ, and this time do a search. For the data that uh, may have the um, customer churn information that we are looking for. Um, so I've searched for, I'd heard through tribal knowledge that that data source was called CRM, but um, after looking through the Alation catalog, um, finding out that this, this data set is actually out of date. So probably saved me a lot of time in not trying to make use of this outdated data. Um, we see that there's actually a new data set that is endorsed as being the latest and greatest. Um, and if we want to ask more questions, we also have information like who is the steward of this data, who is the top users. So if we want to validate that this really is the best set, we can um, go contact those users and, and very quickly understand a lot more about the data. All right, so we now have the two data sets. Uh, this second data set is that customer service information where we understand now, for example, which, um, how many calls our customers are placing to our customer service team, how long the customers have been with their phone plans, um, their phone number, which is the, the um, key for our customers, as well as this column, which is our, going to be our target in our machine learning operation, um, which is whether the customer has churned or not. So I'm gonna take a look at that column. And we see that 9.4% of the data um, has a true value for churn. Um, that means that they are historical customers and we know that they did leave our service. So about 9.4% of the total data are customers that left. Um, we have 55% of the records here that are also historical data um, where the customer did not leave our service. And we have another 35% where we don't have a value for churn because they're current customers. And these are the customers that we wanna do the prediction on. So we now have our two um, data sets, both from Snowflake in um, our data IQ flow. I'm going to select both of those data sets. And another one of the benefits of utilizing a tool like Data IQ in the, the sense of the, you know, those breaking down of data silos and the, the collaboration, allowing different uh, types of team members to work together, um, is the idea of visual recipes. 
So data scientists or data engineers uh, might write a lot of preparation and the joins that we're about to do in either Python or R or SQL. Um, but of course, you know, that limits the, the number of users that can, that can make those, um, those progressions as we move forward in our project. Um, but with visual recipes, we can bring those two data sets together, join those two data sets together, um, all visually. And I can say that even as a data scientist or as, a, as an engineer, that visual recipes are a lot easier to follow than even looking back at your own code sometimes. Um, so here we can see that data IQ um, suggested that we join these two data sets together based on the phone number, which happened to be a, the correct um, key to join on. And we can then select all of the columns that we want um, to be joined together into this new data set we are creating. Um, another one of the key points here as far as the integration between data IQ and Snowflake is the idea of the distribution of the processing um, in these preparation steps. So we're dealing with a very small data sets. I believe it's about 5,000 rows. But if we were dealing with 5 million rows, um, understanding where we were going to do this join or do preparation um, from a computation standpoint becomes a big issue. Um, we might start a preparation process that takes hours or takes a weekend to finish. And if that does not work as expected, we're going to have a lot of delay in the throughput of our data science team. Um, so what DataIQ does, it gives us the opportunity to either pull that data locally onto our DataIQ server and do the join on the server, or to uh, generate a query, and in this case, send that query to Snowflake and let Snowflake's compute layer um, do that join, which it is highly optimized to do, and we can push off that compute. So if we had five or 10 different people all using this, um, this data IQ server, we would not need to worry as much about some user kicking off um, compute heavy processes that might bog down that server. Instead, we're, we're pushing that compute into the database and taking advantage of that distributed processing. And just to illustrate what that looks like, we can see the query that data IQ is going to generate to do the join. So pretty simple um, join here, but it's still a lot nicer to have this managed rather than um, having to write this as SQL code. But at the same time, if we did want to write the SQL code, if we weren't happy with the join that was created, um, we could also convert this into a SQL recipe in data IQ. And then this, this join would be actually done in code. It would take it out of the visual mode and into a, a SQL mode where we could um, execute that as part of our flow. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this join. And if I go back to the, my data IQ flow, I'll see that visually I now have the two different data sets being joined together. Um, and as part of this join, this is a, the, the data IQ operations are non-destructive in the sense that they are not modifying the original data sets. Instead, they are um, executing a query, which is creating a new data table. And again, this is in Snowflake. So if we take a look at our new data table, we'll now see that we have, for example, the churn information um, in the same row and the customer service calls all in the same row as our operations information, like the number of daytime minutes, evening minutes that these customers were using their plans. So as part of the, the data preparation in this project, we might wanna create some new features that may help us in doing prediction um, of whether customers are gonna leave our service or not. So I'm gonna select that data set we just generated and create what's called a preparation step. And I think it's been mentioned a couple of times today that data prep is about 80% of most the, the time consumed in most data science projects. Um, and again, being able to distribute some of that work instead of needing to be done all by data scientists or all by data engineers, instead being able to distribute um, that to citizen data scientists who maybe understand at a very high level 
um, the details of the data sets that we're working with, um, but maybe don't understand how to write the code to do the preparation, having the ability to do this in a visual uh, manner is, uh, makes the team much more effective as a whole, we've found. So maybe we want to create a new, a new feature in our data set and we want to call it customer service calls per month. So we do have this customer service calls um, column and we've also got an account length, but this may be uh, very relative, right? We might have, someone might have one call in one month um, and we might have other customers who have one call and they've been with us for 500 months. So let's um, develop a ratio there. So let's make a formula. Uh, Data IQ has a formula language that will feel very at home to people, uh, citizen data scientists who are familiar with Excel, um, writing formulas in Excel, or of course, um, data scientists as well. Um, Data IQ has a lot of out of the box uh, formulas available, and you can also write Python in these formulas. There's specific Python formulas, so you can do advanced processing here as well. So I now have a new column called customer service calls per month, and that is giving us um, you know, a better ratio of those customer service calls compared to the account length. And we see on the left-hand column that Data IQ now has created um, a step which makes it easy for me to understand how that column was created and exactly what was done. Um, if I wanted to, I could leave some notes and say, creating a ratio column. And now other uh, people on my team who come into this uh, step in the future would understand you know, this uh, poor man's documentation, I guess, of what I'm doing in this step. But I can say from experience that coming back to these processes uh, months later, even you know, sometimes you don't even remember why you did something, uh, much less if you're inheriting a project created by someone else. So um, very powerful to, to be able to do that. I'm gonna analyze that customer service calls per month uh, column that we just created. And we'll see that our distribution is, has a gigantic tail because we have one record where someone is doing five customer service calls per month. So really quickly, let's take a look at that record. Um, so we can see I just sorted by customer service calls per month and we see we have some that are a lot higher than we would expect uh, over one customer service call per month. But we see these are all customers that have less than three months um, of tenure with, with our organization. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new step. I'm going to filter with a numerical range and I'm only going to use data, um, historical data where we have customers that have been with, have had accounts for at least six months. So we can see that Data IQ is now showing us, giving us a preview of the records it's going to remove from the data set. And I've now, I guess, filtered some of those. So hopefully we have a better curated data set for our data science efforts. And again, after running that prep step, we will now have a new uh, Snowflake table. And with this data created, um, with this new data set created, um, I'll show another feature of, of Data IQ that our citizen data scientists use on a daily basis. And that's that ability to create visualizations of the data. So say for example, we want to show uh, maybe customer service calls per month for churn. So we wanna look at the customers that have left our service. So the customers that have historically left our service have an average of uh, 0.026 customer service calls per month. And the customers that didn't, uh, maybe not a surprise, had a lot less 0 0.0189 customer service calls per month. So the, the point here being that we can get very quick visualizations kind of at the fingertips of the team as they're working through this project. 
And we can also see for the customers, our current customers, that they kind of fall right in between because they probably, you know, there's some customers here that are probably going to churn and some that aren't. So give us some ideas, but what this really, um, a key to being able to, to do these visualizations is that we can publish these to a dashboard and quickly take this back to our business users and make sure that this fits with their understanding of what the data should look like. Um, so that way, if in case we are prepping something wrong or maybe that idea to drop out the customers with less than six months, um, we can figure that out very quickly and iterate and regenerate data sets before we do our training. All right, so with this new data set created, I'm going to create a new recipe to split out. We mentioned that we have two different uh, pieces of data. We have historical data and we have our current customers. So I'm gonna split out into two different data sets. One I'll call historical. and another current. So I'm going to create two new uh, Snowflake data tables. And now I'm going to define a filter. I'm going to say that anytime that churn is defined, we're going to send those records into our historical data because we already know whether they left or not. And everything else is going to go into that current data set. And again, this is running in SQL. So data IQ is generating a query that is going to be executed by Snowflake. So that data is never gonna move back and forth between our data IQ server and the Snowflake uh, data warehouse. It's really just going to be a query that is executed by Snowflake and a new, a new table uh, schema will be created um, upon execution. So when this finishes running, we should have um, only records that have a true or a false for churn in this set. So if we analyze this, we now see that 14% of the records in this set have true for churn, 86% have false. So that's our historical distribution. So from that data set, we can create a machine, our first machine learning model to try to do prediction on our current customers. Uh, so Data IQ, um, as mentioned earlier, has gives us the ability to write machine learning models in code using our Python, but they also have auto ML tools that allow us to, like Data IQ will create the model for us visually, um, but still give us the ability to translate that model back into code um, if that is, if that's our preference as we move forward. But I can say again, as a data scientist, that being able to um, create these models in, in a visual manner is a lot easier to iterate upon. So it's easy to um, make models very quickly, make changes very quickly, and then if we land on something that looks like it's gonna be successful, we could always recode it, um, now understanding um, where, you know, where the positives and negatives are. Um, so I won't go through all the details um, of this visual interface, but we can see that 14% of our data uh, customers did churn. Um, we're able to pick out which features we want to utilize in the creation of our model. In this case, for example, I'm going to deselect the phone number since I don't believe that the phone number uh, is has any sort of a correlation with whether someone is going to leave the service or not. Um, and we can see that, for example, that Data IQ is doing standard rescaling on customer service calls, and we can understand how they're going to handle missing values and things of that nature that would be done as part of the prep um, going into a um, machine learning model. So I'm actually going to deselect the customer service calls also since we're doing customer service calls per month. And then Data IQ is providing us with a couple of recommendations for algorithms to use. Um, these are again um, open source algorithms that use underly underlying technologies like scikit-learn, we can use uh, TensorFlow, Keras, uh, XGBoost, you know, a lot of different, different options which we would normally write using Python. Um, data IQ is suggesting a bunch of hyperparameters for us that our data scientists would normally need to um, define in code. 
I'm going to go ahead and hit train to kick off a training process. So DataIQ is going to use two different algorithms to train on our historical data and score those two algorithms against each other to tell us which one hopefully is going to um, work best in the future. And we see here that the random forest algorithm scored much higher on this specific task um, with a limited amount of training um, than the logistic regression. And we can inspect that model um, and interpret the variable importance to understand that you know, this model believes that daytime minutes, daytime charge, and customer service calls per month are by far uh, the top uh, most influential variables as to whether a customer is going to churn. And we can look at the subsequent uh, confusion matrix to understand you know, how, how uh, accurate um, our model is in making those predictions on the training set. So let's say we love this model. We want to use this to predict um, our current customer data. I'm going to go ahead and deploy this model back to the flow in data IQ. So you see these two new green nodes are the model that has been created. Um, so now I'm going to use my model to score the current data. So I'm going to create a new score node, again, all visually. So I'm going to select my current data set, which is that Snowflake database, uh, Snowflake table, and go ahead and run the scoring. So when this finishes, we will now have a new table that has um, predictions in it as to, for every one of our current customers, whether our model believes they will churn or not. So we see again this, this data set has nothing in the churn column because these were all of the current customers. But at the end of our set, we now have a probability column that the customer is going to churn, a probability that they're not going to churn. And the two of those would add together to 1.0. And then based on a threshold defined by our model, we see a prediction of whether each customer is going to leave our service or not. So if I analyze uh, those predictions, I see our model believes about 13% are going to leave the service, about 86% are not. Um, and we can take this data and provide this, send this back to our customer service team so they understand uh, maybe which customers to contact to you know, intervene and maybe suggest a better plan so they don't leave the service. And a good way to, of doing that might be, and I'm gonna, kind of show an unnecessary step here just for the purpose of, of showing how code um, can be integrated into this flow. So I'm going to choose that data set and I'm going to create a new Python recipe and I'll call this our customer service results. And let's say we wanted to do this in Python. Maybe there's some advanced analytics that we wanted to execute in, um, in this Python step. So our data scientists will be at home um, working in Jupyter. And I'm just going to copy in some code quick that's just going to select a couple of the columns from our original data set. And hopefully that will work for us. So now we see a Python node is um, in line in the flow. So as a data scientist, citizen data scientist, Python developer, R developer, those can all live together in the same project and all contribute to the success of, of this business prediction. Um, so this, this Python, um, simple Python script, all it did is trimmed out a lot, of the, a lot of the data in that data set and gave us a phone number and maybe a probability so we can rank which ones we feel most strongly about and then a prediction of whether a customer is going to leave or not. Um, and I know we're about out of time, but with this new data set created, uh, we can now share this back with our customer service team, either through Snowflake and the, the Snow, Snowflake data sharing capabilities. We can share this through an API. Um, data IQ gives us the ability to, um, to generate an API directly from a model to make future predictions in just a couple clicks. Um, and also, we can index this data set 
back in elation. So now future data science projects or maybe future business analysts that want to uh, be able to reference that data set. We'll have that all accessible at their fingertips. We can go, um, you know, create tags and, and perform documentation on that data set because this may be very valuable for other members of our team in the future. And I think I'm about 30 seconds over, so I will hand it back to you, Tony. <laughs> Great job, Ryan. Thanks for that. Um, it doesn't look like any additional questions came in. Um, I'll give it 20 seconds here. I actually have a question for you, Ryan. Um, you know, you're showing the dashboarding. Um, something that I don't think we talked about was the processing of the dashboards inside of uh, the utilizing Snowflake compute for that. Um, maybe while we, um, and I want to put you on the spot, but maybe while we wait for the Q, any Q&A to come through, you want to show that real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So we had created a chart and again, this is a small data set. So where, where, this, um, where this chart, where the data for this chart is computed is somewhat trivial. It could be done on the data IQ server, but if we're dealing with big aggregations and large data sets, um, we may want that, that aggregation to be done in a different engine like Snowflake or a Spark. Um, so with data IQ, we're able to also push that processing in database. So send that off to Snowflake and I can say I've been part of projects where just dashboards have taken servers to their knees um, when we have mass amounts of data um, and we want to do a, a presentation. Um, being able to push that off into an a excellent compute engine that's scalable like Snowflake is exceptionally valuable. So um, I can select in database and now the computation of this chart takes place in Snowflake and the results just display within data IQ. So it gives us a lot more flexibility from that um, computation perspective. Excellent, thank you. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions that came through. So with that, I wanted to thank everybody for joining uh, this Distilled Data Heartland and uh, have a great, fantastic day and hope to talk with you all soon.